Hello and welcome to D2L Fusion. Please welcome to the stage CEO and founder of D2L, John Baker. Ooh, I'm a rebel just for kicks now. Uh, thank you very much, Barry. That was a very nice introduction. Thanks to all of you, wow, <laughs> for this very awesome Fusion welcome. And welcome to Anaheim, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. What's that? No, okay, they're just excited. All right, they're very excited. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules, being away from the family for a while, to get together to talk about the future of learning, to network, and to share ideas. You know, it's funny, uh, a recent event that we did was in Kissimmee, Florida, which, by the way, is the home of Disney World. Uh, then we uh, were now here at Anaheim, the home of Disney uh, Land, and I want you to know these uh, locations were chosen by committee. <laughs> and by committee, I mean my three daughters. <laughs> now, before you judge me, try to say no to those faces. <laughs> Now, speaking of entertainment, my daughters absolutely love a cartoon called Bluey. All right, I saw a few nods from the parents in the crowd. <laughs> For those that don't know, Bluey is a great show. It's about an Australian cattle dog and her family. But here's my real point. If in the not too distant future, we're all hosting this event in Sydney, Australia, <laughs> or perhaps nearby New Zealand, you'll know that I wasn't kidding. The committee has struck again. <laughs> Folks, I'm very excited about this conference. We have an agenda that's tightly focused, practical, challenging, and relevant to this moment. In fact, this year, the team chose my learning moment, by which I mean yours, as our conference theme. I love that word moment. And if you've been to Fusion before, you'll know that I love exploring etymology, the roots of words. And moment is one of the oldest words in the English language in any language, actually. It comes from what's called Proto-English, an ancient language. Originally, the word was pronounced mu, which meant to push away. And then the Romans came along and turned it into momentum. Then English adopted and shortened the word. Now, here's what's interesting. The words minute, motion, move, are all related to the word moment. So when you piece together the history, and you look at the depth of meaning in the word. A moment is two things at once. Something you move away from, and something you move into. The poet, Henry David Thoreau, summarized those complex, contradictory notions in one beautiful line when he said, you must live in the present, launch yourself on every wave, and find your eternity in each moment. I love the way he phrased that. You must live in the present, Launch yourself on every wave and find your eternity in each moment. In other words, this moment, your learning moment, is about the actions you take moving from the past to the future while being firmly rooted in the present. It's a rich concept, one that I'm sure that you're all gonna love and explore uh, starting at this conference <laughs> right here on this, this stage. And I wanna explore particularly three different moments. First, our learning moment, or where we have been and where we now find ourselves as educators and leaders. Second, our creative moment, or the opportunities that we have before us to move forward. And then third, we'll take a look at our next moment, at what the future looks like. Now, if all that seems a little nerdy for this early in the conference, don't worry. First of all, I think nerds are great. I am one. And second of all, I know that we've served you a very green welcome drink to give you a boost this afternoon. <laughs> but more importantly, I think this is a really exciting trip from start to finish, and one that's filled with hope and possibility and optimism. Now, let's be honest though. Times that we're in don't feel very optimistic. We're anxious about the economy and the rising cost of living. We're anxious about our social fabric and the constant discord and division in public life and on social media. We're anxious about technology, particularly AI, and how that it's sped up our lives and seems to threaten our livelihoods. We're anxious about the health of our planet and human rights 
and the list goes on. But I want to give you an important nugget of context and hope. Here's what I've learned and what I see when I speak to young people. They are amazing. And it's not just me saying this. There's a lot of research that says Generation Z or Gen Zers are uniquely suited to face and to solve the anxieties of our time. They've been getting ready their whole lives to rise and meet this moment. There's never been a generation more confident and comfortable with technology. There's never been a generation native born to social media. But Gen Zers are, and they know its strengths and weaknesses. They're a generation that has deeply held values and beliefs. They have unshakable beliefs about social justice and inclusion and the health of our planet. They are smart, they are funny, they are independent, and they are educated. Folks, they've got this. This is a generation more than others that knows that learning is key to their success, that learning is what will get them and all of us through these tough moments in history, learning to better understand our world, learning to make our own positive contributions to it, learning to put our challenges in context so we can better deal with them. Remember, this isn't our first time in history that we faced anxious moments. Looking back at how other people face these moments helps us better deal with the challenges of our own time. And that brings me to my first point, which is describing this unique learning moment. And to better understand that moment, with all of its rapid changes and deep challenges, let's go back in time to the middle of the first industrial revolution, when people in the Western world were being forced to give up on farming because machines were taking over. Farming was being automated, and so was factories. It was the age of the machine, and people were worried about losing their jobs, and the world seemed a little scarier and a little less warm and personal. Now I ask you, does that sound familiar? I want to show you something. This painting was created by a French artist in the late 1800s. Take a moment to take it in. The artist was asked to imagine what the world would look like in the year 2000. Now, there's a lot going on in this painting. For starters, he gets a lot of things right. I remember walking into schools in the year 2000 and seeing kids lined up in desks just like this. I remember distance education in the year 2000. It was being done by audio tapes and headsets, just like we see here. And for a lot of people, this is what emergency remote learning looked like during COVID. <laughs> so in some ways, this painting is pretty accurate. But in other ways, he got the year 2000 completely wrong. For example, the kids are not wearing stonewashed jeans. They don't have frosted tips. And they don't certainly seem to be tapping along to InSync or Coldplay. So he got that wrong for starters. <laughs> But there are two other big things that he got wrong. First, that learning would be mechanical. Here, we see a machine being hand cranked and books being fed in like a wood chipper. And that's because in the machine age, people were worried about machines dominating the future, metal machines. The second thing that they got wrong, was the, and the biggest, I think, was the place of the teacher, sitting far above and away from the students not speaking with them, not engaging with them. That's never been the case in any classroom that I've ever walked into, not in the year 2000 and not now. But in the 1800s, this was a very real anxiety. They worried that in the future, machines would take the place of people, and that one of the most human of all activities, learning, would become cold and calculating and impersonal. Does that sound familiar too? To me, it sounds like the worries that people have about technology today, and again, especially AI, that it will displace us, dehumanize us, and ultimately replace us. And if you dig around, there are a lot more paintings and pictures like this from the Industrial Revolution. But here's the thing. None of those dark predictions turned out to be true. And I think I know why that is. If we project our current anxieties onto the future, it'll always seem bleak. But I prefer not to see the future from a place of fear. I prefer to see it from a place of hope. Because, and this is something that we always seem to collectively forget, not only are we humans incredibly adaptable, but we're the ones who make the technology. It's a human construct. It's an extension of who we are. 
not a replacement for us. Plus, there's a fundamental truth about being human. We all long for connection. We all want to be loved. We all want to learn and become better, sure, but never at the cost of who we are. We shape our tools, but we need to acknowledge they shape us too, which is why it's essential we humans keep our hand on the wheel, constantly learning, constantly shaping the tools to ensure that technology ultimately improves the lives and of all of us. That's vital for us to remember, even when it comes to technology as scary as AI. Folks, if you haven't been able to tell, I have faith in humanity. I have hope for the future, because we humans shape that future, and that includes our technology. We always have, which is why the future that we're building here at D2L always places humanity right at the center of it all, right at the center of learning, where it belongs. Take a learning platform like Brightspace, for example. Does it take the place of an educator in the classroom? Of course not, because that relationship, educator to learner, is a profoundly personal and human connection. Now, I know some critics will say otherwise, and I think that's fair because during COVID-19, while learning was remote, because it had to be, a lot of people use emergency remote learning, but it's very different than online learning. There are two very different things. Emergency remote learning often use tools like uh, Zoom that were used for business meetings and simply ported that experience over to the classroom. And as screens went black, I think we all realized there was an engagement problem. It's like that old expression, when the only tool that you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And for a lot of schools and companies, the only tool that we had was a video conferencing tool, so every classroom looked like a work call. And it's safe to say that it didn't work for every parent, teacher, student, or employee. But a platform like Brightspace was never intended to be used that way, as a stopgap measure. It was designed to create rich learning experiences, to support better learning experiences, to give better feedback, to help with better engagement, better retention, and better accessibility. It's designed to be a complete learning system, one that enhances that class experience. And I can say that because I invented it. <laughs> now, back in 1999, because uh, as a young engineering student, I had a burning question. What's the most important problem that I can solve that will have the biggest impact on the world? And the answer then, as it is now, was the same, to transform the way the world learns, to harness that technology, to offer tools to support the very human enterprise of learning, not to replace that vital relationship. And I'm proud of where that work has led us. Among all the things that Brightspace does, it facilitates better learning experiences. It unlocks new pathways to learning. It removes barriers for better inclusion and gives educators better tools to inspire. Now you know this, because most of you use our product, so I don't have to tell you what a powerful ally in teaching that Brightspace can be. The question is, how do we use it now and other tools to tackle this post-COVID moment with the many challenges? Now first of all, Brightspace supports lifelong, life-changing learning. I think we all know that a college or university degree isn't where learning stops anymore, not for any of us. And Brightspace supports that lifelong journey through micro-credentialing, stacking for easier progression, by supporting things like competency-based education. And I also know that we can't get through this moment to a better future if some of us are left behind. I'm thinking particularly of people whose social economic or health or cultural or other circumstances leave them behind right from the start. One recent example of this is the partnership that we have between Southern Arkansas University Tech and D2L that helped two students with vision loss overcome barriers to learning. It's a story about how we can continuously work together to adapt the learning and teaching and tools to solve challenges together. Now, Sao Tech uh, has a number of students who have chosen a university precisely because they have a reputation for accessibility, which is why the university started to use Brightspace in the first place. Now, back in August of 2021, two of their students with vision loss were having issues completing their assignments, and the university reached out to D2L's customer success team. We all met with the students to understand the issues, and it turned out to be problems with a third-party product they embedded into Brightspace, which sometimes happens. 
Our team found a workaround, recorded instructions to help the students complete their assignments, and the university responded by saying how happy they were and appreciative of, the, of our team's extra effort and decided to convert all of their quizzes over to Brightspace since it worked so much better with screen readers. Now, it didn't end there. We hosted a webinar at the university on improving educational experiences for learners using screen readers, which then turned into a whole course that's now hosted on D2L's Accessibility Academy. I'm proud of that effort, and I'm proud of the way D2Lers support customers in building accessible and inclusive technology, content, and community to support that teaching and learning practice. Now, the cool thing is, I've heard stories like this on many different campuses and in many different companies that I've visited throughout the year. You're making a big impact by reaching every student everywhere. Now, there's more that we can do for all of us to seize this learning moment. You know, for people that are struggling with automation or AI or rapid change, we need governments and employers to invest in skills. And I would love to see grants and tax credits offered to support people in that lifelong learning journey. We need more, not less, investment in the technology that supports learning. Now, I believe D2L Wave is a great example of a tool that can support the learning journey for workers, not only in large organizations, but also in the backbone of our global economy, small to medium-sized businesses, where owners sometimes struggle to support the learning journey of their employees. Employees who need lifelong learning and skills and training just as much as workers in large companies, which is what D2L Wave is all about. Through Wave, we're bringing people an online catalog of the highest quality learning opportunities offered by top tier higher education institutions like many of you in this room. And I believe that working together, we can narrow that skills gap and to support career advancement. It's useful for everyone in organizations of every size and in every sector. And by working together to remove the friction in upskilling, we're making it easier to personalize the education needed to help accelerate that career advancement for millions of people. And this will help us reshape our economies, all while providing a strong ROI and efficiency for companies that are embracing upskilling as a benefit. Now, in a time of change and churn, I believe that we need new partnerships, new pathways, new ways of thinking, and new pedagogical approaches. Now, folks, uh, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was the big, bad new technology on the block. And it was going to make a lot of skills and jobs obsolete. And yet today, it's just another tool that we use in the classroom, which is why I, should, I think we should explore new technologies, like how to productively integrate AI tools like ChatGPT and others. And I know that many of you are already thinking of ways to bring this innovative technology safely and creatively into the class. I'm confident that you are rising to meet this moment. So let's move to my second point, or the opportunities that we have before us to move forward with our creative moment. Now, for context, my parents, as many of you may know, are teachers. And that's a big reason why I'm up here today. Their jobs were vital. And they were a lifeline for a lot of kids. Because in the small fishing village that I grew up in, there was one ticket to a better life, and that was through education. My parents had to be creative, courageous, and challenging teachers. They had to be the kind of teachers that could see not just who their students were, but who they could be. And create those inspiring learning moments to spark the imagination of their students and to open their eyes to achieving more than they ever dreamed possible, something they could never picture before, equipping each student with the tools to realize their true potential. Now, this is hard work, and it's why I admire so many generations of teachers that have committed themselves to their students, like many of you in this audience today. And our job with a platform like Brightspace is to help educators and leaders like you do this transformational work. And that's why I'm excited that our team is working so hard on Creator Plus, which is making it far easier to build those beautiful and engaging learning experiences. And I keep hearing from customers that are using this new technology on how it makes it easier for them to create these interactives quickly and give learners real-time feedback in their own voice 
using formative practices that take no time to build. I believe this is a step function improvement, condensing 20 years worth of learning science into the platform, and in turn, allowing you to deeply enrich that learning experience for so many students. Now, as you walk around this event and attend some sessions, you're gonna see a lot of people using Feeder Plus, and I encourage you to do that. And of course, it's not just the technology tools that are making this your creative moment. It's big shifts in the science of learning itself, again, like competency-based education, or the movement to teach durable skills like leadership, research, entrepreneurship, design, creative problem solving at an even earlier age. All of these are examples of how you're rising to meet this learning moment with your creative moments. And that's another reason why I am so hopeful for the future. Now I see schools and businesses becoming places of creative education in a way that we've never seen before. And that is exciting to see. Because in the 20 years that I've been working at D2L, I've seen learning science, pedagogy, classroom instruction, corporate training, all take big leaps in creativity thanks to the dedication and the hard work of educators and leaders like you. Which brings me to my third, final, and shortest point. What your next moment, our future moment, what it could look like. Now folks, I know it's risky to make predictions about the future. But as I travel to campuses and businesses around the world, what I'm seeing is a great appetite for learning. In fact, I've never seen more demand for better learning experiences than what I'm seeing today. I'm seeing people that are brave, bold, and creative. I'm talking about you. In your companies and schools and classrooms, I'm talking about the learners you reach. You are what inspire me. Now, after more than two decades of starting this company, I'm more excited than ever before about where the world of learning is going. That's how I choose to forecast the future, not from a place of fear, but from a place of hope. Not hope that's grounded in some fantasy about how things will be, but hope that's grounded in the reality of how things already are. I see educators coming through the fatigue of the past few years, and while I know it's not always easy, I see you renewing your energy. I see you embracing new approaches and new technologies to meet the needs of today's and tomorrow's students. I see learners and talent working in companies, diving into new methods of learning and succeeding. I see businesses and schools transforming digitally, and I see momentum in online learning. I've seen it used for a catalyst for personal fulfillment and for rapid career advancement. I see a deep desire to reach every learner everywhere. And I see the excitement and impact learning at every stage of life can have in every corner of the world. And learners and educators across the globe who are wrestling equally hard with the small everyday problems and the big world-changing challenges. And all of this is why I believe this moment, your learning moment, has undeniable momentum, has unstoppable motion, and that when we move together as partners in learning, there's nothing that we cannot achieve. Thank you, everyone, and have a great fusion. <laughs>